Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride that I introduce our panel this afternoon and kick off the Financial Post Outlook Lunch. Please join me in welcoming Terry Cochran, Diane Francis, and Don Martin from the Post, Warren Jeston from Scotia Bank, and Len Crispino from the Chamber of Commerce. I'm now going to pass things over to, uh, to Peter Kent, who is the Deputy Editor of Global News, who will uh, take us from here. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> thank you, Alan. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us again this year for, um, for the FP Outlook event. Uh, I'm pleased to assume the role of moderator once again for, um, for the Outlook Luncheon. Some years it's turned into the uh, told you so affair. We'll see whether uh, any of our uh, columnists and commentators uh, uh, drop that line today. I'd also like to thank the Canadian Club of Toronto and the National Post for inviting me to participate in today's program. As Alan said, 2007 has been uh, an exceptional uh, news year, and the flight of the Canadian dollar has shaped up to be one of the leading stories of the past year. The National Post um, invites you to today cast your ballot, you'll find these ballots on your table, to predict the closing value of the Canadian dollar at the end of 2008. Just to remind you, uh, at year-end 2007, uh, the Canadian dollar, the loonie, closed at 1.0087 cents, nine-tenths of a cent above parity. The individual who submits the most accurate prediction will, be, will receive an award at this luncheon a year from now. So if you haven't already filled in your prediction on the Canadian dollar ballot, which can be found um, at your tables, uh, please do it now. Completed ballots can be simply left on the table. They'll be picked up um, by staff um, afterward. This afternoon's program will proceed as follows. Each of our expert pal panelists will take to the podium to make their case and to present their forecast for the year ahead. Following the final presentation, and uh, we've limited each of our speakers to uh, six minutes each, uh, if you hear the tinkle of my glass, it will be a reminder that, uh, that we have uh, reached that, uh, that limit. A little bit of overrun is always uh, allowed, but uh, try to leave as much time as possible for the Q&A. <laughs> and for the Q&A, again, uh, as Alan said, these cards are on your table. Um, you can jot down uh, questions at any time uh, during the presentations, uh, hold them up, and um, they will be uh, retrieved and, uh, and brought to the uh, podium uh, for the Q&A session. Um, and we really encourage you not to hold back and to uh, take uh, advantage of this opportunity uh, to put pointed questions to, to any or, or all of our speakers. So now, without any further delay, I'd like to call upon our uh, first presenter, Mr. Warren Jespin. Warren? Thanks very much. Um, Peter's given me six minutes to summarize what's happening in the global economy, financial markets, commodity markets, and how it Im impacts Canada, Ontario, and the GTA. So I, I have a feeling I better get going. Um, the one thing that I would say for sure in the forecast is one of the key executive characteristics that we're going to need this year is stress management, the ability to deal with stress, because you are going to see very volatile markets and probably a lot of surprises before the end of the year, economic surprises before the end of the year. But within that, I'd like to leave you with seven take-home messages that come out of our forecast that I think uh, will develop as we go through the year. The first one is that we don't believe the U.S. goes into recession. We think it skirts it um, and comes very close in the first half of the year, but by and large manages to, uh, to mumble and bumble its way through at a very, very slow growth rate. And the reason is simply that three-quarters of the U.S. economy is services and that tends to be more stable than the good side, residential construction and the like. That said, if you're in good construction or if you're in construction and the like, it's sure going to feel like recession uh, through the first part of the year. The real surprise, we think, in the U.S. is that when they reach bottom, it's going to be a very long haul to actually get growth going again. So we wouldn't be surprised that the period of recuperation recovery lasts well into 2009 and in some sectors perhaps, uh, perhaps beyond. We don't buy into the stagflation scenario either, that's with slow growth and high inflation, because we believe as the economy goes down, inflation will not go up. There's going to be pockets of it in agriculture and commodities and the like, 
But the broad indicators of inflation we think are going to ease in the U.S. with discounting uh, by retailers and a variety of other things that will tend to, uh, to uh, moderate inflation. Home prices, for example, are already falling. falling. In, uh, in the rest of the world, the emerging economies, China, India, Russia, and the like, we still expect fairly rapid growth. Now, China, we believe, will slow down because the developed economies are weakening to about 10 percent growth or so. And uh, you will find India perhaps around 8 percent or so. This is an important part for the Canadian forecast because it's one of the things that keeps commodity demand very, very strong. And we believe very fundamentally that the emergence of consumers that did not use oil, did not use industrial metals, did not uh, participate in uh, power plants that use uh, uranium and the like, will keep the commodity markets very strong through this year. And even agricultural markets with the advent of biofuel as an alternative fuel are going to remain, uh, remain quite high. That's very, very good news for commodity producers. Our best guess is oil averages about 90 bucks a barrel this year, up from 72 last year. Uh, it may be close, it may be not. Uh, but the bottom line is we think that oil is going to remain historically very high and is likely over time to remain strong because of global demand. On the Canadian front, we believe we do have a performance edge over the U.S. Certainly, we've got a leap and loony that's caused a drag on the economy. We've got problems with our principal market in the U.S., but we've got some things going for us as well. Huge fiscal stimulus coming out of the economy. GST cut today. You probably paid a bit less for your coffee this morning. Uh, it, you're going to see a lot of stimulus coming down the pipe whether it's at the provincial level or the federal level. Our households also have better balance sheets, not as levered as in the U.S. And uh, as a result, we think that the residential market remains fairly uh, well bid. We think that it's going to remain relatively stable and provide much, much more support than what's happening in the U.S., which, of course, in the U.S., it's a major drag on the economy. And if you put that together with commodity prices that remain strong and provide a, a big boost to the West, Inevitably, we think we outperform the U.S. slightly, not a lot, uh, maybe two and a quarter percent growth or so, as opposed to something less than two percent in the U.S. Uh, the real issue, though, is dealing with a currency above parity and still being able to outperform the U.S. is a very notable achievement. It's all coming from domestic demand. Growth, as you would expect with a commodity forecast that we've got, remains best in the West. Manufacturing is going through major uh, shifts. The tourist industry is going to have to deal with a, uh, a currency at, at parity, and that's going to be a lagged effect because many of the convention bookings and the like have been done quite a while ago. We think these industries will be in for adjustment. They would have been in for adjustment even if the currency hadn't been shot up as spectacularly, although it's a much more compressed and profound adjustment now. But even then, don't count Ontario out. I've already mentioned the fiscal side of uh, of stimulus that's coming down the pipe. We also have big expenditures on infrastructure coming down, whether it's in the hospital, education, social infrastructure and the like, which provides a bit of a boost. Uh, Ontario also has about 140,000 international immigrants coming uh, in each year, about 90,000 to the GTA, and that provides uh, notable support for consumer spending and stimulus for, for the economy in general. And uh, within the GTA, the concentration of health services and education and the like provides an underlying momentum that we think keeps the economy growing. Not quickly. We think Ontario's growth will be under 2 percent, roughly half of what we're seeing in Western Canada, but some growth is better than no growth at all. Turning to financial markets, lower interest rates are definitely in the cards in the U.S., 75 to 100 basis points, one full percentage point perhaps by, uh, by mid-year. Uh, the reality is if the uh, U.S. economy goes from slow growth to no growth, the Fed will simply keep cutting until the, the economy begins to respond. And that puts the Fed out of sync with other central banks. Europe is still talking about raising interest rates. Japan is talking about perhaps nudging rates higher. And in Canada, we expect maybe another quarter of a percentage point uh, or so reduction in rates. But I don't think the Bank of Canada goes a, hot, a whole lot more with the amount of fiscal stimulus we have going and with a relatively buoyant condition out west. So that leads me to my fearless forecast of the Canadian and U.S. dollars. Inevitably, a lot of volatility. Just think last year we went from 84 up to about uh, about 10 in the space of eight months, an extraordinary period of uh, exchange volatility. Hopefully, we're not going to have a repeat in that order of magnitude. But in currency markets, volatility is the name of the game. The U.S., we believe, on balance, its trend is going to be down over the next few years. The question is where they are relative to that trend. 
we believe effectively they cannot uh, bring their, uh, their uh, trade balance or their trade deficit under control. Global investors are diversifying their portfolios uh, away from heavy concentrations in the U.S. and also across asset classes. All of these things tend to make it more and more difficult for the U.S. to fi finance a trade deficit that is currently running about $800 billion a year. Can't export the way out of it. It's all, exports are already going double-digit rates. They've been for some time. Imports have slowed down very dramatically as consumer spending has slowed, and still that deficit remains very, very high. The only way to rebalance is uh, for commodity prices to come down dramatically because that represents over $200 billion of the U.S. trade deficit in oil alone, or the deficit with China uh, begins to come down. Uh, and we don't think that if it, that turns, it's going to turn very rapidly at all. So the U.S. dollar remains chronically weak in our forecast, not only for 2008 but beyond. Which leads me to the loony. Well, the negatives on the U.S. dollar, in a way, are balanced by some positives in Canada. We have a more cautious monetary policy, certainly not cutting as aggressively as south of the border. We are a resource-rich country in a resource-short world, and investment will flow in because of that. We have fiscal surpluses. We're trying to get rid of them as fast as we can, but inevitably we still have them, and we stand out in the world uh, because of that. And inflation remains uh, relatively well contained. All of those things suggest to me that the underlying trend in the Canadian dollar is up. The speculation amongst economists right now is where are we relative to that trend? My suspicion is we're probably in the mid-90s right now in terms of the trend rate, but it is moving higher so that on balance, I believe the Canadian dollar will average above parity this year and above parity next year as well. Best guess for average this year around 102, 104 and slightly higher the year after that. And that's my story today. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. That was a uh, tightly packed six minutes. I'd now like to call uh, Terry Corcoran uh, to the microphone. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. And I'm just going to move your notes over here, wherever his notes are there. And thank you very much, everybody, for being here. And a happy 2008, the year of the rat. In, in the Chinese uh, zodiac. Uh, now, my Chinese sources tell me it's nothing to worry about. According to official uh, zodiac websites, it says, being born a rat is nothing to be ashamed of. Some of the best people are rats. <laughs> in China, the rat is respected and considered a courageous and enterprising person. Now, all of that may be true, but I also did a little bit of a statistical correlation the year of the rat occurs every 12 years. Going back to 1948, I found that the last four of those five year of the rat years produced recession and economic turmoil. In 1948, a recession that lasted 11 months. In 1960, a recession lasted 10 months. In 1972, it led to the first major oil crisis. In 1996, the year of the rat set the stage for the Asian currency crisis. The other year of the rat was 1984. No recession, but it was the year Canada first elected the Mulroney Conservatives. <laughs> so many liberals in this crowd. It's... <laughs> and now this year of the rat, 2008, seems though set to deliver uh, a multiple whammy, a rerun of the last five years of rat years, a recession, an oil crisis, possibly a currency crisis, and the beginning of another long run of Mulroney in the public eye. <laughs> no matter how you look at it, though, 2008 does seem to be taking on ominous and somewhat dangerous qualities. Around the world, we're looking at major indicators of government-induced economic turmoil, from the global credit crunch to the record price of oil, from the falling U.S. dollar to the looming threats of massive regulation of energy and carbon use. Uh, now, on the economic front, Warren seemed somewhat optimistic, although we're at that point in the economic uh, cycle, as it were, where economists start to change their forecasts. And I noted on Friday that Ted Carmichael of J.P. Morgan uh, cut a couple of basis points or a few basis points off his U.S. and Canadian growth forecast for, for 2008. 
And then talk of a recession in the U.S. has picked up significantly over the last few days in the United States in the wake of the unemployment report. Now, another sign of trouble, the price of oil at $100. It should come down, and it might. But on the other hand, there are a lot of people who don't want it to come down, including most governments around the world. OPEC wants high oil prices. Environmentalists want high oil prices. Canada's roundtable on the environment this morning called for a carbon tax to raise oil prices. Major political figures in the United States and Canada welcome high oil prices because they supposedly curb demand and help reduce carbon emissions. The United Nations wants higher oil prices. Now, remember when the oil industry was controlled by the major private oil companies, the Seven Sisters? Through, through those decades of competition and capitalist motivation, oil was cheap and it was plentiful. Now oil is mostly controlled by governments and state corporations. So oil is expensive and getting scarce. People thought the Seven Sisters were rapacious. Just wait till you see what happens when governments control things. Now state corporations also run and own, uh, uh, or, uh, and government-owned corporations are also expanding in other areas all over the planet. Chinese and Middle Eastern governments are bailing out American and European banks. And the greatest state-run operations in the world, our central banks, are bailing financial markets out of the credit crunch that the central banks helped create. Now, all this seems to me to be not be a good thing. Another sign of economic trouble on the horizon is the U.S. election. The field of candidates, for either party really, is dominated by interventionists. All are obsessed with energy independence, an objective that requires massive regulation of oil, market distorting subsidies, carbon control schemes, and not to mention more regulation of the auto industry. Among the worst of these interventionists is Barack Obama, the current media darling. Now, I predict, that's a dangerous thing to do here, uh, Obama will not survive the primaries, and I think even Clinton may take New Hampshire tomorrow by a very thin margin uh, over Obama, and that will be the beginning of his decline. Now, not that Clinton's policies are all that much better. In fact, they're often worse. Now, in the election of November, she'll end up against uh, McCain or Giuliani, probably McCain, and between the two of them, it will be close in November. Now, last year at this time, I predicted that there would be no election in Canada in 2007. That's still a good bet for 2008, although I'm a little less confident. Still, not one of the parties is in a position to trigger an election. The Conservatives continue to undermine their own supporters moving to the left, and now they seem to even to reject the idea of tax cuts and seem to take some joy in warning Canadians that their climate change program is likely to bite into growth in 2008. And finally, let me close with the last item on this year's RAD agenda, the Airbus affair and the return of Brian Mulroney to public life, so to speak, Schreiber scam. Uh, I happen to think Schreiber's scam has gone about as far as it can go. It's, it's not a trivial issue. It's outrageous that a former prime minister should treat somebody like Schreiber, like an, all, uh, like an automatic telemachine within weeks of leaving office. And I think there should be an inquiry. But if there is one, I predict that we'll find that there's nothing more to be found in terms of Airbus payments or other scandals. And so that's it for 2008, the Year of the Rat. Thanks for listening, and have a good one. Thank you, Terrence. Next up, National Post National columnist Don Martin. It's with a bit of trepidation I stand here, and not because I've got my publisher and my editor and my managing editor sitting here, but I also have my brother and sister back there. 
And my sister's threatening to ask me a question at the break about why haven't I called my mommy recently. So I'm feeling a little choke up about that. Anyway, I'm sort of the virgin of the panel here. I haven't done this before, so I can claim that every, every prediction I've ever given at these things is 100% accurate. So I'll move along on that quickly. I think the greatest insight we had into 2008, what was coming, was actually in Harper's year-end interviews. Um, the Prime Minister does these 10-minute snippets with reporters. We all line up at 24 Sussex and get ushered in. And um, I was the last one of the day, and um, I walked in and sat down, and the, and the flax started her stopwatch for my 10 minutes. And the Prime Minister leans forward and says, I'd like to give you my statement. I said, I'm sorry, i got 10 minutes. I don't have time for your statement. And he said, uh, now, we know Mr. Harper likes to control the message, so he was a little taken aback by that. I said, look, we've already had our Can West reporter. I'll listen to his statement when I get in back to the newsroom. I don't need yours. So let's move along. But actually, the statement was kind of interesting because it talked about the fact that the economy is going to tremble and, you know, there, there are the days of guaranteed revenue stream growth and huge fiscal surpluses are probably coming to an end if Canada catches the American uh, economic flu, which seems likely. But he also wanted to make the point that the minority government was working in his view and uh, that he could see continuing to govern uh, as long as the opposition parties would let him. Um, and that, uh, but if there was an election, uh, he was ready to fight it and he would uh, do severe damage to the liberals. Uh, unfortunately, what that means is we're going to face another 2008 that looks very much like 2007 in terms of we're going to have this never-ending never -ending referendum on the Harper minority government. We're going to have all these live broadcasts to count down votes, and we're going to have, you know, running back and forth to the scrums and the FOIA saying, are you going to support the government on this, are you going to support the government on that? And, and it's kind of ironic because we're finally getting a parliament that has elements that are working. Um, you're seeing legislation passing. Uh, the Chalk River nuclear power plant uh, situation of December was very interesting in that all four parties got together within one night and passed uh, legislation forcing that reactor back online. Uh, you could see it starting to happen. Like, uh, and, and we're also heading into a year where there's some defining issues, finally some matters of some substance. Um, so uh, you, know, you, sort of, you look at that and you kind of go, well, what, in, what is going to cause an election in that scenario? We have the new Democrats and the bloc saying we're going to take them down at every opportunity. So that forces the poor, hapless liberals to act as conservative toadies if they, if they want to keep the government propped up. And, uh, and if they don't uh, prop them up, then they're going to be in an election they're clearly not ready for. So what seems to be happening is we're moving towards an election showdown that may end up with us in some sort of Seinfeldian election about nothing beyond what the, uh, official, the office, official opposition saying we're, we're doing our duty and taking the government down without any real cause. Um, as you know, the pundit wisdom, and that's a bit of a moxymoron, I'm sure, to most of you, but uh, the pundit wisdom is that the March 17th by-elections uh, will not be necessary because we'll be in an election campaign triggered by the, by the budget uh, taking them down. To that I go, are you kidding me? I mean, the budget... Uh, the Prime Minister has clearly signaled that this budget is going to be a prudent, no thrills, no frills budget. It's going to be one that has already dealt with the tax cut question rather effectively. I know Terry wasn't the biggest fan of the t tax cuts last fall, but I think that you know, most voters will look at those as significant, and they're going to get a nice little bonus in the, in the mail comes the spring, because a lot of the, some of these tax cuts take effect going right back to last January 1st. So to have a campaign running against the budget, at the same time people are turning, turning into their mailboxes and finding refund checks on their taxes, is probably not good political strategy for Mr. Dion. Um, the, the only other thing that, one other thing that people keep talking about as a wedge issue is climate change. And I think Harper government's done a lousy job of, of communicating their plans on climate change and making it appear they're trying to take the problem seriously. But the issue is, all going to be locked up this year in regulation, not legislation. And regulations don't have to come to the floor of the House of the Commons. So, and they're going to be fairly heavy-handed regulations. Uh, the industry is probably going to kick and howl a bit, which is good for, your, for you if you want to be seen to be taking action on climate change. So I suggest that there's no option for the Liberals to go force us into a vote on the climate change question, at least in the spring. Which brings us to Afghanistan. Um, I think it would it would not be hard to imagine what John Manley's panel is going to predict come, um, I guess it would be later this month, early next month when they report. 
Uh, he is going to recommend that the mission be extended to 2011. He's probably undoubtedly going to talk about Canada putting a lot more emphasis on training soldiers and police and doing more provincial reconstruction effort and a lot less conflict role. Let that turn, out, turn that over to the Afghan battalions that are now in place. So you ask yourself, how, can, how on earth can Stéphane Dion vote against an Afghan mission modification that's been recommended by a former liberal deputy prime minister that is really inherently fairly reasonable. I mean, it's, uh, it's not going to be something that will uh, uh, take us out of the casualty risk, um, you know, the casualty risk business. We had two more soldiers die today. Um, uh, but it is one that is going to give us a, a chance at seeing some hope and seeing some action uh, moving forward in a positive way in Afghanistan. So I have, I have my doubts that he can force an election over Afghanistan. The main reason that Stéphane Dion cannot have an election this spring, and that's not saying there won't be one in the fall, but in the spring, is that he is completely and utterly unready for that election. Uh, you only have to contrast the conservative election readiness with the liberal election readiness. To, I've never seen anything so dramatically divergent in my life. Uh, the Conservatives have a war room that would blow your socks off. This thing has Stephen Harper could move into an industrial park in South Ottawa and literally conduct the whole campaign from there and no one would probably notice it outside of Ottawa because he has backdrops and studios that will project whatever city he wants to be uh, talking to. He's going to have He's going to have podcasts, he's going to have Facebook, he's going to have YouTube. I mean, these guys are ready. They have war room computers and strategists lined up. The thing is ready to go. Flick a switch and the Conservatives are in an election campaign with planes and trains and an automobile ready to rock and roll. So you look at the Liberals. My God, they haven't got a plane booked. They haven't got, they got leaders. The leader's office is changing staff so fast I can't even keep track with my, with my, uh, with my Rolodex on who's doing what anymore in there. The, even insiders are telling you that the liberal leader himself is not listening to advice, not taking advice, and doesn't know who to talk to anyway. So it's all very, it's, it's, it's incredible. And they're financially, they're just not ready to do it. Anyway, long story short, if we're forced to the polls, uh, Stephen Harper's team wants to project themselves as having a leader who can deal with economic challenges that are coming forward as a result of the slowdown in the economy. Uh, Stéphane Dion wants to lead into the charge on, on poverty, a war against poverty and becoming the jolly green giant of, uh, of uh, Canadian politics, which is going to be a hard sell. And uh, it's going to be an unfair clash, frankly, in my view. So my prediction, fearless as it is, is, uh, is that we'll probably see an election in the fall and I think Stephen Harper has a pretty good shot at forming a majority government, very small majority government, but one that nevertheless, uh, if, if he can overcome the reticence of women voters who just don't like the man, um, uh, he, can, he can pull this one off. Uh, and my other prediction, of course, is uh, the United States of America gets its first black president a year from about this month. So anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Don, for an uplifting uh, look at the year ahead. Uh, before I call on our next panelist, I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone of the Q&A session um, after the uh, final speaker. Uh, please be sure to uh, put your questions down on these cards at your table, hold them up when you're ready, and um, they, will be, um, they will be recovered. I'd now like to call upon our fourth panelist, Mr. Len Crispino, President and CEO of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Thanks very much, and I uh, want to thank the, uh, your organization, Alan, for inviting me to uh, join with this illustrious uh, panel. Quite frankly, I'm not sure why they invited me, but um, I'm not, I don't have any financial forecasts or wise predictions for the year ahead. All I can tell you is this is going to be a terrific uh, year for vintage wines in Ontario. <laughs> so please go out and buy Ontario wine. Really, what I would like to focus in on today, just for in the brief uh, six minutes that I've got, is the, what the 400,000 small, mid-sized companies in this province can do to affect change in uh, 2008. Monetary policy, as we all know, is largely out of our own hands, but we can have significant influence over the direction of our own businesses and collectively, I think we can have a large impact if we work together. 2007, we had the greenback that faltered, the loony soared, and we reacted. 
In 2008, I think we must begin to be much more proactive to begin what will likely take a generation to change, and that is to begin to develop an export culture in this province. The Canadian dollar dominated news and public discourse, not just on Bay Street, but also on Main Street. On Bay Street, the ripple effects of the economy, uh, economists arguing one way or the other whether monetary policy should be changed or not changed. On Main Street, retailers have felt intense pressure from their once loyal customers. And our manufacturing and agricultural sectors have also felt the impact of their more expensive exports. This, I believe, has shown that we're dangerously reliant on one market alone, and that's the United States. In 2006, nearly 90% of Ontario's exports went to that one singular market. Now, and people would argue, well, why not? Southern Ontario does reach 135 million people within a radius of about 1,200 kilometers, has the same language, some people would argue a similar culture. Um, so focusing on the U.S. market has been a very natural evolution, and Ontario's proximity to the U.S. has, in fact, become one of the key competitive advantages. But I believe this geographic advantage has also led us to be complacent. Not that we should abandon our focus on the U.S. The U.S. market, I believe, will always be the most important and largest market uh, for the province. Now, long before the uh, subprime crisis, our vulnerability, I believe, was apparent. Think of 9-11. Suddenly, the border, which was the conduit to get goods and services across to our, la our largest uh, neighbor, became a choke point for our economy. Earlier in 2007, border crossings were as clogged as they were immediately after 9-11. We've had confusing and prohibitive border regulations that have also negatively impacted on tourism. Again, the singular reliance on the U.S. market has proven to have its downfalls, add a strong Canadian dollar, and suddenly it's more precarious than ever. I would argue that we must develop an export culture that looks beyond just our southern neighbors. Governments, both federal and provincial, can help to instill this culture while companies in Canada must also refocus their efforts. Canadians have often been accused of being too humble, of failing to promote our advantages, and I believe that that's true. Take the natural advantages in terms of our infrastructure development. Canada was built on infrastructure development. Canada, because of its expanse, by necessity, had to connect itself through infrastructure development, whether it was engineering, whether it's uh, tele telecommunications, but the question I would ask today is who's building the roads, who's building the bridges, the telecommunications networks in emerging countries and emerging economies, not Canadians. And with a few notable exceptions, where are the Canadian firms on international consortia that are seeking large capital projects? Take the U.S. Uh, from the statistics, take the U.S. out of the export numbers and our numbers are very minuscule at best. 3% to the UK and about the same to all of Asia. 3% of, of our exports to Asia. A market which is staggering in dimension so much so that the stats have now, I believe, have become cliches. Companies around the world are targeting opportunities in emerging economies. France is expanding its Champagne region by 15% to meet consumer demand largely fueled by India and uh, China. So today, a diversification strategy for a company is no longer a luxury. It is, in fact, a necessity. And we don't have to be large. We don't all have to be rims to uh, be successful. A small Toronto company has just set up a flagship store for the clothing retailer H&M in Shanghai. Another Ontario company has built the first regulation size rink in Asia. So, in closing, Ontario does have many successful entrepreneurs. We have highly educated, multicultural workforce, both business and government, 
as well, by the way, as well as labor and academia, I believe, have an opportunity in 2008 and beyond to begin that process, that process to create an export culture that allows us to be able to compete with the best in the world and win. So again, my prediction for 2008, buy those wine futures. <laughs> Thank you, Len. Last but not least, um, as seems to be the habit every year, uh, I'd like to call Diane Francis to the podium, not only as a favorite FP columnist, but this year as a distinguished visiting professor at the Rogers School of Management at Ryerson. Thank you. Well, I'm going to do a whirlwind tour like Warren and try and get a lot in here. Um, Last year I said that the dollar would be at par with the U.S. dollar, uh, so I was right there, but I also said that would happen the year before, and I wasn't right. Um, higher oil prices, higher gold prices, I think that that is a given. Uh, that's a supply demand situation. That's China, India growth, and the United States, which I believe will continue to grow in Canada. Um, I think the stock market will be good this year, despite some of the subprime and other fallout, and that's because, historically speaking, uh, the fourth year of a presidency is always the second best stock market year. Go figure. I don't understand why, but and last year, uh, the third year of a presidency is always the best of the four years, and that was, certainly was a good market. Uh, we had four shocks this year, something that came out of nowhere. Uh, Mulroney telling us about all this cash that he received, confirming it. Uh, hugely disappointing. I like Brian personally. I am forever disappointed. Um, the subprime thing came out of the blue. I think we'll find in the fullness of time that's a massive fraud perpetrated at various levels of the mortgage and Wall Street markets. Uh, Conrad Black's conviction, I don't think uh, I saw that uh, as actually happening. It did. Very tragic. Too bad. Um, I like Conrad. Uh, I worked with him. Uh, that's enough said about that. The Alberta royalties were a shocker to me because Alberta is sort of very free enterprise. And you had this uh, farm popu farmer populist uh, become premier and undo a lot of the deals that were uh, made by Klein's government in the back room with the boys from the oil industry, which I don't think I ne necessarily agreed with. But it was a pretty shocking uh, royalty hike and wasn't a great thing for them to do reputation-wise. Um, and we'll see. I think they'll tweak it a lot. I think there'll be an election there. Now, going forward in 08, I think we're going to hover around parity. I think gold is going to hit 1,000. I think oil is going to stay around 100. I think the Canadian dollar will continue, as I say, to, to not only be at parity, but go, go higher on, on occasions. And then, of course, we're going to have the, the big political reality show for the next 11 months. That's the U.S. election. And that's so exciting. Um, I'm a junkie, so, uh, you know, it's a given that I follow it. But it's going to be an enormous distraction, and nobody is going to be able to escape it. Uh, my fearless forecast, which is on my blog today, uh, is, is, of course, Obama and McCain will take New Hampshire. And uh, if Obama does that handily, which it looks like he will, then South Carolina, Michigan, he's unstoppable. And McCain is going to face a real challenge in South Carolina because that undid him in 2000. The Bornigans didn't like him. But uh, I think this is the year of the Mavericks. I think both McCain and Obama are, have mutual respect. And they are very different people, but they are both Mavericks. They are both non-status quo people. They have both differentiated themselves in the path past. They have the courage of their convictions. They're very bipartisan. Uh, and I think that uh, they will uh, and will continue to catch the imagination of the American voting electorate for right or wrong. There are some major things behind, there are some major trends that I perceive behind this development. I think, first of all, we're seeing the baton pass from the baby boomers, idealism and ideologies. We're very, my generation, the baby boomers, were very idealistic and very ideological. That dog doesn't hunt anymore. And I think the Gen Xers, our kids, are now in charge of Hollywood, running newspapers. Our kids are not ideological and they're not idealistic. And I think Oprah and, and Obama and her help and so on, I think, uh, encapsulates that interest and that shift from ideology and idealism. The Americans uh, have been very uh, upset by the war and the fact that they're waging a war and you can't bomb 
people into democracy and for enterprise and, and the 21st century. They're learning that that doesn't work, and they're at the same time suffering from probably the worst health care system in the developed world, without a doubt. Um, the environment is a concern, immigration is a concern, and all of those things will happen. But I think that there's a lot of negativity in the press, and I just want to set the record straight. I'm exceedingly optimistic. I think that North America is the best, most prosperous place to live and will be. Uh, yes, the Americans are going to spend a billion bucks on this year's election campaign. That's roughly half what they spend buying chewing gum. Yes, they may only grow by 2% their economy or even 1%, but 1% economic growth in the United States represents 25% of the Canadian economy as a whole. Uh, this is a very wealthy country. The subprime is a problem. Pockets of real estate regions are in terrible depression and free fall like Florida and Arizona, but other parts are doing just fine. And the actual stats are the home equity balance in the last 10 years for American homeowners has gone from 30 trillion to 58 trillion, even after the falls and collapses in certain neighborhoods and regions. So it's a very strong country. It's, it's still financially very capable. There is an enormous cultural, socio-political shift underway in these results in Iowa and then in New Hampshire. And I think it marks, as they say, the passing of the baton from baby boomers like me and Clinton to our kids who are now in charge. And they don't take, they don't like politics. They're not that interested. And they're not going to take positions. They just want somebody with an open mind with an IQ. And that's certainly what Obama has. And McCain. In Canada, I think, I think uh, the Tories are wise probably to call an election, even though they don't have to because the Liberals are nowhere and they can continue to govern the way they will because once Bob Ray gets in a seat, he's going to just, uh, he's pretty, pretty lightning at the microphone. And whether you like Bob or what he stands for or not, he's going to reinvigorate. He's going to be the actual de facto Liberal leader. So I would, I would have an election before you have Ray to, to, uh, to fight against. And uh, as I say, I think basically North America is in great shape. Canada is a wonderful, prosperous country. The United States is our partner. They are very prosperous. And I think it's going to be a really interesting election year in both countries. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And uh, to keep the momen momentum going, we'll go straight into the uh, Q&A. And the first question for Terry. And it is, how soon do you see the U.S. getting out of Iraq? Does it matter who wins the U.S. election? Who would ask you a question like that? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea, uh, but uh, certainly not, next, not this, uh, this uh, coming year, 2009, 2010. It'll be a long time uh, coming and a very slow pullout, as best I could uh, assess. Maybe others have different views. Diane, I don't know. Yeah, Nixon ran on a platform of getting out of Vietnam. It took him six years. Okay, next question for Warren, again on the U.S. election. You didn't mention the impact or not of the coming U.S. election. Will who wins significantly impact the U.S. Canadian economies? I think whether the, uh, whether the Democrats or the Republicans come in, the reality is the U.S. has a trade problem. And that trade problem in uh, Congress is going to generate a more protectionist stance, whether it's process protection or something uh, uh, more subtle. Inevitably, I think you're going to find that the U.S. becomes a uh, harder uh, bargaining uh, trading partner. Canada has an umbrella through NAFTA. It's a bit of a leaky umbrella. Uh, but other countries around the world are, are, I think, going to find it more difficult to negotiate unless there are strategic issues at hand. A question for uh, Don Martin regarding Jack Layton. Has Mr. Layton, for all intent and purpose, become a lame duck politician? <laughs> well, he might take exception to that. He was my prophet at Ryerson, and he gave me a D in political science, so I feel... <laughs> <laughs> this is sweet revenge right now. <laughs> um, Jack's very uh, confident that he can take seats from the Liberals. Uh, I don't know why he, he thinks that's the case. Uh, I think people uh, on the left will want to rally behind one party to keep Harper from getting a majority, so I, I think it's unlikely he'll increase his, his seat count. Uh, Jack's 
interesting problem is he's got this guy named Thomas Mulcair who is from Montreal who won a by-election. And Jack was sitting on the stage the night of the election, beaming and happy about having this guy in his seat. And I'm looking at him thinking, he doesn't know that this guy's got the knife out and has put it at his back, because this is going to be the next leader of the New Democrat Party. And he is, uh, if, if Jack Layton doesn't increase his seat count in the next election, uh, you're going to see a, a leadership uh, race triggered on the New Democrats. So in that sense, he's, uh, he, he's got one more chance to prove himself, and then he's uh, gonzo, and um, I think that's my uh, D assessment of Mr. <laughs> <laughs> a question now for uh, Len Crispino. Um, where, how does the vital social element of affordable housing and its development fit into 2008? Now, who asked that question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Uh, well, I can no, tell no, it's you. okay. <laughs> All right, I won't tell you. Um, I'm not quite sure which angle the, uh, the question was asked from, but um, if, if you're asking the question from the standpoint of how does it fit into um, the economy and um, where as, a, as an economy we're going with respect to infrastructure development, which that's the interpretation that I'm taking on the question, um, I do believe that, and I want to go back to the comments I made earlier about uh, infrastructure that we, as generally speaking, as Canadians, I think, tend to underestimate what we're about. And I'm not sure whether it was Fotheringham or at one point uh, said that perhaps Canadians uh, um, suffer from what's referred to as a Canadian disease, in that we tend to underestimate our capabilities in Canada and that maybe we need to begin to reach out and look a bit further and I know somebody mentioned that this was the year of the rat. Maybe it should be the year of the oyster. <laughs> a question uh, for Diane Francis uh, regarding health care and Obama. You mentioned the travesty of U.S. health care. What do you expect to improve here if Obama wins? If, it, to improve in Canada if Obama wins? That's the question. I don't think he, we're part of his platform. <laughs> Um, I think that there's a couple of things that are going to affect Canada, uh, and I think one of the things that we have to really do, and I'd like to see the government do more of that, is that I agree with Warren, there is going to be more protectionism as their, their dollar sags and they have some other issues, but um, basically Canada has to separate itself from the three amigos, and I think that we have to make the case in the United States and in Washington that we are not a problem on the border as is Mexico, whether it's immigration, because immigration is going to be an enormous issue in the U.S. And McCain may falter in his campaign because he's talking about complete amnesty for the 12 million illegals. And that is also causing border issues for us. And so I think that to the extent we can differentiate ourselves from the Mexican problem, uh, I think that we will be fine. But if we can't, and we haven't been able to as yet, uh, we're going to have some of that backlash. A question now for Warren on uh, Canadian business results. Aside from the banks, where do you expect the best results in Canadian business in 2008? Well, I think uh, obviously in the manufacturing sector and in the uh, services that are competing uh, on, on a cross-border basis, the, uh, the margin compression is going to be pretty significant. You've already seen the stock market build in uh, some pretty optimistic expectations of what commodity prices are doing, but I think that in terms of cash flow and, uh, and, uh, and potential, the, the commodity sector and the service sector that supports the commodity sector is going to do reasonably well. A question uh, for Don, and it spins off a remark by Diane. Diane said youth don't like politics. What's the impact you expect on voter turnout for any federal election in 2008? Hmm. Um, yeah, apathy reigns at all demographic levels right now. We're getting dangerously close to the point where you know, almost half our electorate won't vote, and that's you know, unforgivable, really, in a democracy. But um, we're seeing a little bit of encouraging signs that youth are starting to 
take the political process a little more seriously. Um, I was talking to one of the producers last night of the show, uh, I want to be prime minister when I grow up or whatever it is, it's called, the, it's sponsored by Magna International. And they're getting unprecedented responses to their show and un unlimited, unprecedented numbers of applications of youth that want to go on there. And I know the conservative uh, clubs on campuses are showing a surging enrollment, particularly, on, uh, as I said, for the conservatives, maybe not so much for the liberals. But, um, you know, there are signs that the youth are getting involved. The, I, the podcasting that the Harper government does is seem, I, I, I find it, uh, you know, Okay. Horrifying to look at podcasting and seeing Stephen Harper come up on my iPod, but um, the youth apparently like it. So, um, uh, so I, I don't, I don't despair that the youth have completely given up on politics. Although apathy at all levels is something that should be addressed. Uh, question for Terry on OPEC pricing: Will 2008 be the year when OPEC moves away from pricing oil in U.S. dollars to pricing in euros? or a basket of currencies? Uh, no, I wouldn't think so. Uh, uh, and in some ways, it, the, the, well, first of all, there would be no uh, great gain in moving to euros. Euros are a relatively small share of the international trading system. And the U.S. dollar uh, pricing uh, uh, basis uh, serves them well and serves the whole worldwide economy well, and splitting it up into half euros or half uh, dollars or some other combination just wouldn't be, wouldn't be sensible. Now, maybe uh, Warren has a thought on that as well. I mean, it's talked about a lot. I think uh, there, there are two issues. One, uh, uh, you've got to remember that the reason, one of the reasons why oil has shot up so dramatically is because the U.S. dollar is so weak. And effectively, there's been compensation on that side. But at the other extreme, you've got to remember that once the dollars come in the door, uh, the major funds in, uh, in, in OPEC can then reinvest them across currencies and the like. And the more I travel globally, talking to major funds, finding out that uh, repositioning assets away from U.S. dollar uh, exposure is the way things are going. So after the fact, effectively, you can get the diversification uh, once you've sold the oil. Okay, our final question, and thank you uh, for your response. We've got some very worthy uh, queries here, but just don't have the time. So our final question uh, is to uh, Len Crispino. What's being done to help these Ontario entrepreneurs grow abroad by government and by uh, financial institutions? Well, I think that uh, if you look at other countries around the world, they started fairly early on in terms of beginning to develop that export culture. If you look at European countries, um, it, it's endemic in terms of their education. And I think that's perhaps where we're failing here in this country, that that culture has to take a generation to take hold. And uh, I think that's where we at the Chamber are trying to work with government, labor, and academia to uh, try to get that early on the, the, into that kind of entrepreneurial ship um, uh, focus and so that people um, are able to kind of look beyond just their own borders and to look at the opportunities that exist elsewhere beyond our immediate borders. Okay. Thank you, Len. And that concludes our uh, Q&A session. Before I turn uh, the podium uh, back over to Alan, who will adjourn the meeting, I'd just like to remind everyone to take advantage of the uh, complimentary National Post subscription that is provided for you all today. These cards are on your table. It will entitle you to a 30-day complimentary digital or hard copy subscription if you are not al already, as you should be, an avid subscriber to the paper. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their participation today. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you once again to Alan Odette and the Canadian Club of Toronto, uh, to Gordon Fisher and the National Post for putting on a great event. I now uh, welcome Alan to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Peter, and I think the, uh, the audience will, uh, will join you in uh, thanking all of the panelists for doing a great job with a uh, tricky task. In light of this past year's surprising turn of events, predicting the course of the year to come takes some fearlessness. The American commentator George Will once said that the future has a way of arriving unannounced. Uh, we're all uh, here this week into the new year. The future may have arrived unannounced, but it might well prove to be very entertaining house guest. Thank you again to the members of our uh, intrepid panel for their uh, valiant forecast for the coming year. I've made note of the uh, 
the dollar predictions. And thank you as well to the Financial Post for hosting this great event this afternoon, the first of many more important entertaining Canadian club gatherings in 2008. I thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to the year 2008 and have a terrific afternoon. Thanks.